Well, I'm going to start now. Uh, Junko's allowing me to introduce um, our speaker today, Jeff Jeffrey Taylor, who is uh, my student. So I'm going to introduce him from me, like me. And uh, he is going to be presenting work on his dissertation. So the first half or first part of it, he's going to be back in the field this year. So this is ongoing. And I'm assuming it's kind of a stall thing for us here in, 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 in art. Anyway, uh, but before that, I wanted to just say that we have one more um, tight lunch next week, even though it's RRR week, so something's changed. We have our final one next week, which will be Carol Redknapp, a, 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 a long-term member of our community um, on her Egyptian work. And also, I wanted to say that you're probably aware if you spend time in ARF or have um, issues or problems or engagements with ARF, you'll notice that um, the assistant, Miko Weirich, is now only working uh, part-time here because of due to the pretty radical uh, cutbacks that the VCR's office is going through and passing down to all ORUs. So um, if you have issues that you need to have done, like stall or brawn especially, but primarily stall, you know, financial things, uh, you want to try and get to her in her hours, office hours, 9.30 to 11.30, unless she posts it otherwise. That's sort of where we are right now. And I'm guessing that'll stay through the summer, maybe change at some point. But, but it's um, the way of the world, the new world here in Berkeley which is a lot of fun. Anyway, you can bet. So, without further ado, we are hearing, I don't know if it's the same as that, so I'm going to read this, Urban Life and Foodways at Wari, Ayacucho, Peru, uh, 600 to 1,000, that's the middle horizon for those of you who know the phases, uh, spatial macrobotanical analysis. So, take it away. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, First off, this is a new project that sort of came into development last, about a year ago that I was invited to come and take part in the excavations at Wari and be the paleoethnobotanist to run flotation and analyze uh, the macrobotanical uh, remains we recovered from the site. Last time I spoke to you was sort of a, a stall fulfillment on previous field work in a completely different area. Um, that project has been put on hold because this was um, the quickest and best way to get out with a dissertation that people will read. Um, so here we are. Basically, we have a, an NSF-funded project run by William Isbell of Binghamton University, Barbara Wolf of Montgomery College, and Ismael Perez Calderon, um, licensed archaeologist from Ayacucho that works at the university uh, in Ayacucho called UNCH. Unch by its initials. Um, so basically today I will present a quick background to get you up to date so that when I do my exit talk I don't have to do a lot of work on the culture and the history of the archaeology. I can do more work on the data. Um, I do have data. I've been working in the lab quite a lot since coming back from the field in about November. So I have preliminary analyses to share. Um, so we're going to do a whirlwind tour of WARI research and a slideshow of what we found from our excavations, and then we're going to hunker down in some of the data that I've generated so far. So basically we're talking about a time period called the Middle Horizon. You can see that the dates are changing through my slides. Uh, AD 650 to 1000 is maybe what we're more likely to accept in the coming years. Our dates. Uh, work with that quite well. This is a time period largely defined by uh, two proposed polities in the highlands of Peru, uh, Tiwanaku and Wari, which are intertwined in ways that I can't untangle here. But this is a picture of Tiwanaku. It's a big monumental architectural center, probably a pilgrimage center um, of religious and cultural significance for a very long time, even predating that beginning of the Middle Horizon uh, date. And there's an, an example of some of their pottery. You'll probably be able to see some slim similarities in Wari pottery. Um, here is a general map of the idea of territoriality between Wari and Tiwanaku. It's much more complicated than this. It's much more patchy. And the nature of 
control or even intention to control is highly debated for Wari and Tiwanaku both. Um, basic history is we have uh, very early on Max Uli at the turn of the century uh, defined a Tiwanaku style and a coastal Tiwanaku style in the ceramics that people were finding. Uh, Julio C. Teo went to the site of Wari. He did a little bit of test excavation, a lot of walking, found that the coastal Tiwanaku style may originate from this highland center at Wari, that it's a very monumental, monumentally large site uh, with a lot of dense uh, remains on the surface of ceramics, lithics, things suggesting it was an urban center. To him, uh, in the 50s, Bennett and Rowe came to conclusions that perhaps we should stop calling it coastal Tiwanaku and Wari is its own thing. Uh, in the 70s, uh, research into Wari as a state or an empire sort of emerged. Uh, Lumbreras is a very famous Andean archaeologist from Peru, sort of set that groundwork going forward and tried to really cement it in settlement data, which then Isbell and Schreiber came back with, finding that you had, uh, in the time period before the Middle Horizon, you had sort of dispersed but still uh, dispersed settlements that still had a sort of hierarchy, suggesting a centralized political power, according to him. But then during the Middle Horizon, you have population aggregation at this place, Wari, uh, which was sort of the last say when the Shining Path terrorist group, insurgent group, uh, emerged from Ayacucho itself and made it very dangerous for people to work and live there. Lots of people died, lots of people disappeared. Um, so there's several decades where research stopped. And during that time in the research, uh, people continued to write on Wari, work in settlements outside of Ayacucho, uh, working with this Wari as a, as a controlling empire hypothesis, um, which I think is now being broken down by most Wari scholars is not really the whole picture, that maybe there was a time and place where Wari leaders were engaged in imperial action and, and trying to take control of resources in certain places, but it is not true for the majority of regions in the Andes and probably the majority of the Middle Horizon. It's not what they're doing. Um, so now we're just sort of picking it up and research at Wari has been going full steam for a, a number of years, and so we'll cover some of that. Here is a map of all of these sites that over the last 30, 40 years, people have written dissertations and done analyses of and surveyed. And everybody comes in sort of with the question, is it Wari, is it not? Uh, I've done a lot of reading on all of this. And basically, there's any site that people find pottery that looks like Wari pottery, it becomes a very easy for people to get attention and say, this is a Wari site. Um, there is evidence of Ayacucho people building settlements away from Ayacucho and pottery styles from them sort of percolating into the landscape uh, in certain places. So the red sites are, uh, you can see Wari is right here. There's a number of red sites sort of to the south. Those are, I think, legitimately linked to something that somebody in Ayacucho decided to do and go out into the landscape and engage in trade and religious influence and sort of sharing of ideas with uh, native, um, the people living in those regions at the time. The yellow sites are ones where you just have some wari pots. During the Middle Horizon, things look like, basically the landscape is, is such that people were very, very socially and economically linked over a very large span of the Andes. So at sites, for instance, like Cerro Amaru in the north, or Quelap, or San Jose de Moro, people talk about Wari intrusion because they find some Wari ceramics in elite burials. But they also usually find the majority are local ceramic styles, and that people are caching ceramic styles from important influential places across the Andes, that people are collecting things they like, and some of the things they like are Wari, and so people are kind of trying to unpack that, and I'm certainly hoping that our research will better define what Wari is um, so that we can get past the sort of question of was Wari a state, was Wari an empire, 
where are they controlling who and for what reason. If we don't understand sort of what's going on in Ayacucho at the core and understand the, the nature of Wari power in its center, I think it's very hard to make those sorts of inferences about these peripheral regions. And archaeologists were forced out into the peripheral regions for historical reasons, obviously, um, but now we're able to sort of come back and reevaluate. So I'm going to do like a whirlwind tour. This is the central Peruvian highlands around Ayacucho. You have Wari. You have a, another very large urban settlement at Conchopata that's important for me because it's been excavated recently. Nawin Pukio is a, a sort of earlier center that blends into the Wari phase before it stops being of use. Azongaro is a large uh, administrative center, which we'll talk about and I'll show. Um, but so during this earlier period, this early intermediate period, you have a culture called Warpa that has this very distinctive black and white pottery um, with influence coming from foreign regions because even during the early intermediate period and back into the archaic, people are trading ideas over a very large landscape in the Andes. So that's a sense of what pre-Wari pottery looks like for you. Um, and you can see the sort of comparison on the right. Mora du Chayok is a sector at Wari that was excavated in the 70s. Uh, this is sort of typical of urban Wari architecture, these sort of modular units adjoined to each other with a central patio in the center, the little square, and then you have these gallery rooms around the outside in which, which have various activities going on in them, people sleeping, cooking, storing things, etc. Uh, now, in Pukio is a bit earlier, and you can see this sort of, it's, very, it's actually really hard to see, but basically it's, it's not all densely connected. You have little patches of like agglutinated architecture that's not really formally organized like these rectilinear spaces that are repeated and modular. Um, one of the main things that Wari architecture brings that we see sort of move out of Ayacucho is the D-shaped structure. You're seeing a picture of that and it, its excavation there. You can see it on the map of Conchopata, this other urban settlement in Ayacucho by Wari. Um, it's only probably 15 kilometers as the, as the crow flies. So it's, it's really not too far from where I'm working. And you can see these sort of D-shaped structures and semicircular and circular structures sort of repeated throughout the plan. And in these spaces, we have evidence of um, the use of human heads and the, it, as, as items of power and ceremony surrounding them going on here, burning and ritually breaking things and depositing them under the floorboards. It's not a space where domestic remains are found. It seems to be a temple by most people's logic um, for what that means during the Middle Horizon. At Azongaro, this is a bit of a later structure, it seems like, or at least it was used all the way up uh, through the Middle Horizon and, and on. This is sort of a classic look at what archaeologists sort of keyed into when they started talking about Wari as an empire, is you have these, these large settlements placed on the landscape in various places in the Andes where you have a very strict regimented architectural order with sectors of repeating patterns of spaces and you see the patio groups with the gallery rooms, although the patios or courtyards are much bigger in this place. And then you can see there's actually sort of um, more informal architecture down here in the front area. Those are, uh, were excavated and, and are sort of thought to be commoner housing of people that were building this space. As far as what goes on in these administrative centers, excavations have been very, very uh, difficult to figure that out. There's not a lot of uh, convincing evidence as to what these are four. This is an even larger one in Cusco called Piki Yacta. It's an incredibly amazing place. It impresses upon you some cosmological order or idea of what a settlement should be planned like. Uh, all of these little spaces are very tiny structures like two, three meters by three meters. And then you have all of these large patio groups uh, out, out on the right hand side. Um, Excavations here recovered ceramics and some evidence of living, but most of these sectors were unoccupied for the entirety of this existence. And we have radiocarbon dates that this 
people began doing things here at the very beginning of the Middle Horizon, and they were still doing things here at the very end of the Middle Horizon. So it may have been used for something by people in Cusco for 500 years, but as to what, it's difficult. People have thrown out all sorts of theories about it being um, places to house uh, conquered people's mummies as a sort of ransom. People have talked about it as like a prison complex. People have talked about it as a traveling, like a place for traders to come and stay temporarily on the road to various places. Uh, this is what it looks like on the ground. I'm not sure if that's too blurry, but you can see it's just a, a dense checkerboard of structures uh, that go as far as the eye can see uh, with outer walls and streets that are massive and stretch. And you can even get a sense of this was placed in a rectilinear fashion on a very um, topographical surface. So it's, it, they didn't level this out. They're imposing some order on a hilly landscape. And from above, it comes out being perfectly straight. Um, so it remains a mystery. Uh, the Northern Highlands, you have all of these sites that I have categorized as yellow because it, there's contact with this area, but not any evidence of Ayacucho people living there or impacting people in dramatic ways. We're probably going to just go through this, but basically you have these sorts of, it looks like the administrative architecture of the other sites uh, at this site called Viracocha Pampa. Again, never really utilized, never really occupied, uh, at least as far as we can tell. The dates from here are very confusing, so it's very hard for most archaeologists to make much sense of this. But basically, it's argued that there are structures from this region that maybe um, the, this like orthogonal, rectilinear, agglutinated architecture that Wari is plopping down in Piquillacta and Azangaro is based off of some of the things that the local people of Wamachuco were doing around 300 AD. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done there. In the South Central Andes, uh, we have a very good site to really get a sense of what Wari administration may have been like at Cerro Baul. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this because I have there's some botanical data to compare to, but basically it looks like a ceremonial center. It's placed at sort of this uh, borderlands between Tiwanaku temples and areas that Wari's trade networks are connected to. So it seems to be placed there. People are living there for some connection to the Tiwanaku settlements that are very nearby. Um, along the south coast, this is where sort of um, this coastal Tiwanaku idea from the 20s and, and, and on came out of. Basically, we have um, one administrative center up in the highlands called Inca Moco. Uh, and then we have these sites like Pacheco and Huaca del Loro that are so looted that nobody has any good evidence. But basically, there's all sorts of Wari coastal fused pottery there that define this coastal Tiwanaku idea. Um, we have again this sort of administrative plan, and then even a smaller site, Pataraya, which is basically interpreted to be a single household or um, a fairly large household, but it's a domestic center that was planned in a way that doesn't match local architecture, it matches Ayacucho, the Ayacucho architectural canon associated with Wari. And you can see some of like this, this coastal pottery um, that sort of characterizes uh, the, the second half of the Middle Horizon for Wari. Um, and these are found at Pacheco, but they're not provenienced. And nobody's really been able to do excavations there because it's so, so heavily looted. The black market and museums and private collections are all full of pots from these sites. Um, and so just as a quick, yeah, great, I have a little bit of time. Um, just as a quick end to this sort of background into Wari imperialism, uh, just recently we've started to get genetic evidence that's been really, really useful. People studying populations in Ayacucho and people pop studying populations outside of Ayacucho. And they're finding that places where it was proposed that Ayacucho was conquering, they're not finding evidence of people from Ayacucho impacting the gene pool in these places. Uh, as you would expect in a sort of uh, warriors moving out and impacting colonized peoples sort of hypothesis. So that is being sort of rewritten. And instead, we have more evidence of 
people from the coast moving periodically into the highlands uh, in relation to these El Nino events that flood and drought impact coastal societies and they're able to sort of come up into the highlands and, and, and live at least for some time in a more convenient way and it's possible that this, this happened at the beginning of the Middle Horizon during a sort of sudden urbanization movement in Ayacucho that may have been tied to coastal people joining the population in the highlands. Um, violence has been studied um, pretty extensively by uh, Dr. Tiffany Tung, and she's found that violence does look high, and she interprets Wari as a sort of expansionist imperial force, hurting people, killing people, maiming people that are in their way for what they want. Um, but also at Conchopata in the Ayacucho Valley, which is considered to be like a Wari secondary center, there's also very, very high rates of violence related in comparison to earlier time periods. So it may not be that Wari is an external force conquering uh, peripheral people. It may be that Wari is a more uh, heterogeneous set of power structures of people sharing the same sorts of material culture and they're sort of factioning and fighting with one another. And I think that even within Wari, which we'll see in a minute, it's a very, very large site. I don't think that there's even a homogenous power structure within Wari. Um, hopefully we can get at that over the next several decades of people working at Wari of understanding these different ceremonial areas, these different residential areas, and where those people are coming from and what their sort of habitus is like, what kind of integration into power structures do we see um, from them. And then finally, I've been like bashing my head on tables because basically every time people find a burial where there's Wari related things, they talk about Wari lords of settlements that are of conquered people. Um, so we have these sites Castillo de Warme and Cerro de Oro um, on the coast where they have these elite burials with Wari textiles and Wari pots. Um, but, you know, the group at Castillo de Warme did genetic analysis of, of 13 or 15 bodies of the elite burials and found that none of them were Ayacucho. All of them were local. Um, so, it, and then they still continue to say, like, these are the lords of the conquered region. And I, I don't really understand it. Um, at Cerro de Oro, I just saw a really fantastic presentation where they analyzed the, the textiles of this sort of elite burial and found that all of them were done in, in the man, they're all woven in the manner of local weaving techniques, not Wari weaving techniques, not Nazca weaving techniques, and even the very exquisite, loud, ostentatious, colorful Wari finisher on the mummy bundle of this elite was, it looks Wari, but it was done by local weavers in the way that they like to do their weavings. So there's a very interesting sort of breakdown happening, I think. Uh, so this is what Wari looks like on the map. Um, this is uh, uh, from the 70s, where Isbel, Knobloch, and Schreiber went out and dutifully mapped a very hard to map place. Um, first, we're gonna talk about, there's the Peruvian, uh, there's a, a Peruvian government sponsored excavation group. Dr. Jose Ochitoma and Martha Cabrera have been working there for more than five years now excavating ceremonial structures and, and many sectors across the site. They don't get a lot of coverage. Our project has had a hard time working with them. There's a lot of political maneuvering in Ayacucho. I don't think they like our presence, which I can kind of understand. Um, I've worked with them in the past for just a very brief period of time. Um, you can see me there on a stall funded trip. Uh, and you get a sense this is, this is what some of the architecture at, in Wari looks like. You've got these very large walls. There are lintels sort of midway through those walls. So there's multiple stories to these structures. And you can see it's a, a giant cactus patch, basically. So what they're looking at, they're in these ceremonial structures uh, in these regions, Vegetayok, Moko, and Moncachayok. Um, and they're excavating D-shaped structures. They're excavating these storage facilities. They're finding all sorts of fantastic things that I'll just very briefly look at. One of the amazing things is they have all of these sort of 
subterranean funeral galleries for elite people. They're basically excavating royal tombs. That's what the Ayacucho government wants. That's what tourists want. So that is basically the, what they're doing. Um, and so they keep finding below these subterranean galleries, there's more subterranean galleries. And as they go down, they're finding this very non-Wari, more Warpa and Nazca-influenced pottery. Uh, this basically very early period that these monumental architectural structures at Wari are not something from the late period after they have built up steam and have extracted resources from conquered peoples. It's very early. When Wari becomes an urban settlement, they are building temples and they're making, not, they're making Warpa pottery with Nazca and coastal iconography primarily, uh, which you can see again up here. Um, these spoons are very typical of this sort of early 600 AD stuff. Uh, as it transitions, you get this red comes in, which is linked to uh, connections with Tiwanaku uh, pottery. You can see even these, which they found from their excavations, are Tiwanaku, they're very, very Tiwanaku. Uh, I would be very interested to see where the ceramic paste of that comes from, if it's actually a Tiwanaku pot or if it's an imitation, that would be really interesting. But basically you've got sort of two, tra two traditions that are both wari. You have this white and orange slip with these colorful geometric designs that are basically abstract animals from earlier periods of the Nazca ceramic tradition. Um, and then you have this later Tiwanakoid red uh, pottery that depicts uh, things in the style of some of Tiwanako's religious iconography. And they found crazy stuff. Um, gold, they found literal gold idols, um, spondyla shell from Ecuador, which we'll talk about from our area, these bronze tupus, which are pins shaped like parrot heads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, <laughs> so, so that's not my, ex those are not the areas that I excavated, okay? That, that was not our idea behind this, was let's find also really cool gold stuff. Um, the question is, people have long sort of speculated about the population size of Wari, but basically we have an area of several hundred hectares of very dense occupation that appears to be occupied for, in most places for 300, 400 years. Um, the, the idea is the population is multiple tens of thousands. I don't know how that was reached, but I think it's probably reasonable. At the very least, we can consider this a very radical departure from previous settlements in the area. Um, so how did these people live, right? Not everybody was being buried in tombs with gold idols. So what are the average residents out of that 50,000 doing with their lives? Um, is the city of Wari really a singular center? Um, and how did this dramatic shift to urban settlements impact people's social lives and their food ways, particularly? That's my question. But these are sort of the questions behind our project as a whole. So what we did is we went out to an area where there was no standing architecture, um, but still pretty darn close to these monumental architectural sectors. Um, and I guess here's just a sense of what Ayacucho looks like and kind of what, what f field systems look like. You can see this from our site, um, these sort of dry fields on a hillside that I've walked that have Wari era pottery through it, and then areas where it's irrigated where you have this ability to really sustain a lot of agricultural product, a lot of uh, tree resources in this area of Wanta. Um, this is what the site looks like. Uh, this is a shot coming down from the hill into, I mean basically you can see it's very hard to make anything out on the ground and it's quite prickly. Uh, this is what our area looked like. We picked an area that was less prickly, uh, that was not showing any standing architecture that would be easier to sort of get a hold of quicker um, and that maybe wouldn't be the same kind of monumental architecture. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't the same kind of mon monumental architecture. We were basing that off of some excavations in this area done in the 90s by Ismael Perez, which was sort of more of a vernacular style, but still pretty formal. Um, I wasn't personally expecting to find farmers or common sort of people. Uh, here, we're dealing with at least middle class and up. I don't know if I can assume that, but um, so we did some drone work. We cleared the vegetation. There's 
can you find me? I'm in the stupid hat. Um, that's, that's what the field work was early. Um, we did a, a basically we were, we were pulled as a group by two extremes. One was to sort of understand the layout of a neighborhood by following walls and doing wall trenching and try to get as many structures as possible and see how they fit together. At the same time, we wanted to get uh, a detailed examination at some of these rooms and these complexes so that we can actually look at everyday life. Um, so that's one room that we can see these sort of niched walls um, that these guys are excavating. There's from above, uh, all of that is extremely dense architecture. Um, this is what our area looked like after we sort of got through a lot of the season. And we're looking at basically those same patio groups again, um, probably about six of them. According to our director's reckoning, you can see you know, up at three, we've got a corner of a new complex. Uh, one is what we've excavated most of and that we can make the most sense of. It looks like right to the left is another. I don't know about five. Four definitely seems promising, but that could be like a street or something. I mean, I don't know. We need to do work on that. Um, my work is primarily in the rooms that we're excavating uh, from one and I guess two, if that turns out to be what that is. We ran 10 radiocarbon dates. Um, I did a little sort of update of them based on a mixed curve uh, that sort of spreads them out a little bit more, but it maybe is more accurate. Um, so basically, some of the features we're going to talk about, the hearth, which I'm analyzing a lot of material from, uh, dates to very early, dates to 611, so this sort of like pre-Middle Horizon <coughs> right at the start. Um, we've got these early pottery caches deposited under like the low floors of some of these complexes uh, that reflect that sort of Warpa Nazca stuff uh, that date to about 653 to 756, and then late pottery uh, that looks more Tiwanakoid from 694 to 968. That's a range between two dates. Uh, maybe that earlier date is a bit off, I'm not sure. Uh, might be old wood that they sampled for that. But um, this is what the map looks like. I did sort of the geospatial data and ran the GIS for the team. This is what we found. We've got some copper stuff. We've got a little sculpted Wari person on there. That's our sort of fanciest item. One of the interesting things is the incredible diversity of lithics. These are stone tool makers living here, and they know where all the stuff is, and they're employing a lot of different techniques um, and using a lot of different resources. Um, that's the last you'll hear of that, though. Um, the pottery we're finding, this is that early <coughs> pottery cache. You see that sort of uh, octopus, sort of Nazca-looking design. Uh, we have some very bizarre bottles, I guess. Uh, that's what we're calling them, sort of forms that we've never seen before being dedicated under these houses that share a, a very Nazca oriented design. In that same cache, we have this sort of central coast Nevaria style of a serpent. Um, so there's sort of this intentional deposition of items that are showing Wari or Warpa fusion with foreign people that's being put under these first sort of urban structures at the site, which is really interesting as just a background. And then we have a later uh, pottery cache that has this sort of Tiwanako staff god figure and these faces with cro canines crossed, um, sort of supernatural beings. Um, so what I did in the field, um, I analyzed about 100 and no, about 200 out of our 360 flotation samples heavy fraction in the field um, and have plotted that data uh, just to get a quick sense because nobody else is analyzing anything quite yet. I'm sort of the first one pushing for dissertations to be done. Um, so this is a sense of from these different excavation units where the burned bone is and potentially where more of the domestic refuse is deposited and you can see this sort of central area here, this corner room here and this EA1 which was that niched room sort of light up very hot. Everything else is fairly cool. There's a lot of bone everywhere, but that's where the burning is happening. So that's very uh, interesting for me as we go forward and excavate more. Um, the lithic diversity, basically the bigger the dot is, the more flakes per liter came out of that. And then the darker the purple it is, the more diverse it is. Um, so we can see that this household here is doing some stone tool production and they're not just working obsidian over and over again. They're working 
chalcedony and chert and uh, various things that look like turquoise but aren't, and I can't remember what they are. Um, they're working copper. We have fragments of, of copper, maybe from the oxidization uh, process or also from, from the production working with it. Some of them are little fragments of things that look like the refuse of a finished product, the devotage, if you will, of copper um, versus copper products. So the light green is where the copper products are, and then the little fragments are found in the dark green. And so we can see that EA 10, 10 and 11, these two rooms, we have more copper products, but no evidence of working it. Whereas EA1 has this some finished products, but the higher density of the worked material. Um, and the same thing goes for spondylus. So finished beads come out here, but no fragments from the making of beads uh, in those areas. So we've got a definite differentiation of use of space within these compounds. So let's talk about botanicals. <laughs> That's all my background to sort of make sense of this stuff. Um, so there's three main questions uh, that I can sort of take a stab at right now. So one is what, what foods and fuels were they using? Uh, two is what kinds of agricultural practices were they using to feed the population at Wari? Um, and to what degree are the people living in these compounds probably farmers themselves? And then three, what impact does urbanization have on how they're engaging with the landscape and what they're choosing to do with their food? So as a background, there's botanical analysis from Concho Pata. Um, one of the main things that comes out of that is that they're engaging with this plant called moye, which uh, we'll talk about that later, um, which is used to make beer. Um, and basically they're eating quinoa, they're eating maize, they're eating tubers, and they're using this moye product to probably make beer. Um, so that's sort of the baseline of what I expected to find. At Cerro Baul, that sort of Wari administrative center in the south, and then at Tenahaha, which is a sort of more rural farming settlement, uh, we can see during the middle horizon, that's pretty common. Quinoa, maize, parenchyma, which is a stand-in for tuber, uh, moye, present in both. And at Cerro Baul, we have this whole fermentation complex of people making beer out of moye and maize, a brewery uh, that a lot of research has gone into, and so that's thought to be a major part of Wari food. So we did flotation out behind the university. Um, this is like class, I'm just doing nothing and looking <laughs> stupid and my hair's bad uh, and I'm making somebody else do the work. Um, and here's another person doing work for me. Uh, I'm doing as much work as I can, but you know, I, I, for, the for, for everybody, let's, let's engage a lot of people in this research. So I have, um, <laughs> I have, I have five UREPs right now working with me, learning paleoethnobotany, um, getting a sense of this project. I think one is in the, in the audience. Thank you. Um, so th yeah, thank you guys very much. They're, they're learning and, and going into the next year, we're gonna continue on and everybody's gonna be faster and a lot of botanical data is gonna be looked at. So this is, um, these are old, this is old data from at least a couple weeks ago, but what we have is uh, 40, 40 analyzed samples of light fraction from which uh, statistically we have 25,000 specimens, which is a lot, a lot for this region. Um, I'll explain why basically, but Concho Pata analyzed some 150, 200 samples and had about 35,000 specimens. So our density of re just remains in general is incredibly high. Um, what we do have, most of it's wood, which makes sense. Um, but you can see that the biggest slice not wood is bean fragment at 11%, which is very odd, and we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, and so in, as far as the fuel question goes, dung is at about 2%, wood is at about 69.7%. So I think it's fair to say that maybe they're using dung sometimes, but wood resources are their thing. And as you saw in the landscape at Wari, it's fairly arid. I mean, you've got cactus there, and I think if the cactus weren't there, there'd probably be more trees. But just even the landscape outside of that, that's not currently on archeological sites or people's homes, is not forested. It's not a de tree dense place, um, as the highlands of the Andes tend not to be. So I believe to, to service a population's wood needs for several hundred years at a population of 10 to 50,000 is probably means that there's a lot of management going into fuel resources, which I hope I can break down in the future. 
Um, this is a ubiquity chart, and you can basically see just a lot of numbers. I'll talk about it in a better, more digestible way. Um, this is what we're finding. Quinoa seeds makes a lot of sense. Uh, this cooked sort of tuber fragment. Uh, these are very common. It's hard to identify at the moment, but hopefully with maybe scanning electron microscopy, we could do a little bit more and figure out what tubers they're using. There's a lot of tubers in the Andes, potato, yucca, sweet potato, oka, oyuko, achira. There's all sorts of mashua. There's, there's lots of options, um, which would sort of complicate the picture and give us a little bit richer sense of what they're doing. Um, corn kernels are fairly common, as we expected. We got one chili pepper seed, so at least there's like a little bit of flavor in the diet. It's not just like starch. Um, hopefully, that we'll find more of those. Um, and then we have these beans. This looks like a lima bean fragment, but it's, it's uncertain. It's a lot flatter and bigger, and it's got this sort of squarish butt, which really looks like that bean. Uh, but the majority of them are the common bean, Phaseolus vulgaris. And when we take wood out, 43.1% of my weight of food products is bean, which is very unusual. Um, um, <laughs> So I've got a lot of hypotheses working on it. A lot of work will have to go into the beans. Um, the maize kernels are very high, parenchyma, quinoa. The densities of those are higher than the densities at Conchopata. But in addition to that, we have all of these beans. So out of, let's see if I have the statistic. I probably don't, because I read it out of the paper last time. Anyway, so our beans, oh yeah, okay, so at Conchopata, same environmental region, same time period, same flotation machine, slightly refurbished, um, same sampling strategies, same sort of excavation methods, same PI even. Uh, from all of, all of their samples, uh, all 35,000 specimens, they have 20 bean fragments. I have 20 per liter of soil. So it's a substantial difference. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. Um, the moye was expected to be present. It is present in some number, uh, but it is only 0.9, yes, 0.9%, this little pink sliver, much lower. And then in terms of ubiquity across the site, um, the ubiquity of, of various plants, um, the total ubiquity, okay, so wood charcoal, 100%, beans, 100% ubiquity. Every single sample has beans. Every single sample has fragments of tuber. Every, almost every single sample has quinoa and maize. Uh, where is moye? 50%. So it's not an everyday use sort of thing. Wari is a very dense place with a lot of trash from accumulation of hundreds of years of urban residence. Um, not all of these samples, the context is not necessarily very good, but across the average of all of them, they're eating beans a lot, and they're not really engaging with moye particularly, relative to other sites. So that is of interest. Um, obviously, then, this speaks to some agricultural choices. It speaks to the possibility of maize and bean intercropping as a way of keeping those fields going for this dense population. I think that's a real possibility that hopefully in the future we could uh, maybe do some excavation in Ayacucho fields in my future career. Um, then I have a question about what kinds of weeds are popping up in these samples. And basically, um, the number of specimens of weed is lower than most, certainly lower than a rural site. Um, and the colored red ones are probably food anyway. They're just small seeds, kiwicha and uh, kanyiwa, which are related sort of to the quinoa group. Uh, and then moye, which I'm not certain is necessarily uh, about it being food. It may be about it being a fuel. Um, but essentially, these counts of seeds are all tied to just one hearth, basically, that we will talk about. Um, the next question about agriculture is uh, whether they're processing crops in the structures. So basically, I'm recovering both kernels, the edible portion, and then cupules and cob fragments. Um, cupules are basically the little things that attach to the kernels within the cob. And when the cob burns, they sort of separate. Um, and we recover those. 
And so one method of sort of getting a sense of whether people are getting finished corn kernels in their kitchen or getting the cobs and working them in the house uh, is this ratio between the kernels and the cupules. And so a, a rural site like Tenahaha, the cupules are about five to one on the kernels. Uh, at Conchopata, they had about a one to one, which was interpreted as, well, these people, maybe they're farming, but some of them are probably disconnected. The food is getting processed outside of the house. We have a five kernel to one cupule ratio, which is suggesting these folks aren't really engaging with corn cobs. They're just engaging with corn kernels for the most part. Um, so we're getting a sense of how people are processing the crops and where hopefully we can get a better sense as we dig more units. And so this is a map of the dung density across the site. Um, and basically that 2% dung is almost all coming from just this one little corner here, which is our one intact hearth that we have. Uh, with that in mind, uh, this is just one example. This is Asteraceae, which is a wild seed. Um, could be a resource medicinally and, and for various other things as fodder, but it also, and every single seed, wild seed or weedy seed, would map out like this as well, where all the density is in that hearth. Every sample associated with the hearth is dense with these seeds, dense with dung, not dense with anything else, which suggests that that fire had some dung in, in it, um, some of the dung in it, the only identifiable dung within it is guinea pig dung, although research has suggested that guinea pig digestive process does not preserve the seeds, and so guinea pig poop doesn't typically burn and leave seeds behind, so I think they're using mixed fuel there. Um, but what it is suggestive of is that they are selecting weedy crops as fodder, um, and they are entering into either the guinea pigs or the yamas that they're engaging with. Um, so while most of the spaces at the site are clean from wild seeds and weed seeds, showing that they're not processing a lot, they're not bringing back bundles of stuff with weeds attached, um, they are intentionally engaging with wild plants and weedy plants to feed their animals um, and burn dung occasionally in hearths like this one. And then just for a comparison, if you look at say maize kernel density, um, you get hot spots in different places, particularly in those places um, in this house sort of complex. Um, under those white dots are some good ones in the EA1, and then EA10 uh, lights up pretty high for that and for most other food sources. Um, so implications of this, I think I have three minutes. Okay, so sorry I had to sort of rush through a lot of that, but. I'll answer as many questions as you have. Basically, one, the foodways at Wari seem to be fairly distinct from even Conchopata, which is nearby. Conchopata has been interpreted in a number of ways. It's been interpreted as a sort of set of palatial estates of Wari lords and their like multiple wives. Uh, it's also been, been, been described as, as a series of families um, who are farming, who are making ceramics, who are probably gaining power from their engagement with the distribution and the creation of these highly charged ceramics with sort of beautiful iconography that people all the way in the north and all along the coast are interested in having. Um, but Conchopata had this very high density of stone hoes they found thousands of stone hoes at the site. Every house complex had kilns and a lot of stuff for making pottery, wasting sherds, and also stone hoes. Um, and our site has no evidence of ceramic production, uh, no stone hoes whatsoever. The hoes would potentially be used for collecting ceramic clay, but also for just farming. Um, so we're not finding farming tools like we do at other places where people are farming. So it actually looks like probably the people here, based on the fact that they're not engaged with cobs, that they're largely not engaged with weeds, that there's no stone hose, they're not farmers. This is a class of people within Wari doing something to sustain themselves without having to go grow the corn themselves. And then what this speaks to is sort of this relationship between Wari and Conchopata. I think we can start to unpack it a little bit once we understand the different like habitus 
of the people living in the houses in those two places and what kinds of things um, are they engaged with? What kinds of people are they engaged with? It seems like the population at Wari are engaged with these coastal ideas at the beginning um, and there may be something there as we study some of this material culture that could speak to whether the people are are, are making pots in different ways at Conchopata than the pots we find at Wari? Or you know, is it just the food ways or is it every sort of way of life? Are the people at Conchopata living very different lives from the people at Wari? Um, should be very interesting to get a sense of that. Um, and obviously, this is one field season, so we have another field season coming up uh, where more excavation will be done. I'll have more samples coming. Uh, the architecture at Wari is very complex. We have multiple floors. It appears that the space between floors, the sort of fill, is all trash. Uh, basically, everywhere we look is trash. Um, so the depositional history is hard, and also there's a lot of looting. Um, so I'm going to be going down with the goal of taking micromorphological samples. Almost every unit that we've excavated in these in this compound has profile walls intact. So once we open those back up, I can do micromorph. There was too much floating to do, but I will have a team of flotation students from other universities this year, and I'm very excited to be able to be out in the field and try to make sense of the depositional history sort of unpacked. Because as you can see those maps, you know that's just a sense right now of what rooms are doing what things, um, but we have to really unpack which floors are which and which ones have been looted into and maybe completely not very usable. And nobody's really done that work yet. And I think it's going to be difficult without the micromorphological analysis. So that's the next phase of this. Um, thank you to everybody for listening. Ken? So, so they're not actual farmers is what your interpretation is. Which, so far, yeah. Which is fine. So, but you've got all this plethora of lithics and then you've got copper working. So are they possibly like half specialists? I mean, what are they doing with the, I don't want to speak, yeah. leaves us thunder here, but what, I mean, what are they doing with the, with the lithics? Is it, is it some kind of specialization going on? Or what, what do you think I, they're actually doing? I thing? don't think that the, I think that there's a, diversity of craft activities happening in sort of the same spaces. Mm -hmm. So the one niched structure that was, was dug is a hot spot for lithic diversity. It's also the hot spot for spondylus fragments. It's also the hot spot for, for copper fragments. Um, so I don't think that the density of those artifact remains, except maybe the lithics, the copper and the spondylus does not suggest they're specialized bead okay. makers or anything like that. Um, so I don't have a real sense of how they make their, okay. their living, per se. Um, it may be that they're tied to sort of the ceremonial complex that's just, just over 500 yards away yeah. in those galleries. And they're, they're doing things that don't leave material remains in the home for their daily things. But they're, they're well off enough that they can sort of casually be engaged with foreign resources like spondylus and drill beads with their stone tools that they're good at making. And, um, yeah. yeah. So I actually had a question about a different kind of specialism um, which is beer. Yeah. So uh, maybe it's kind of a question or comment. Um, I was just thinking you were talking about you know how beer was kind of important to social life, but you had very little evidence for the material that byproducts were making beer. And I was just thinking about my experiences in traveling around to microbreweries and doing tours and yeah. distilleries as well. And it was a really common, repeated thing that, especially in microbreweries, breweries, I guess because of the scale, that the spent grains were then um, traded to local farms and they were food for animals. Mm -hmm. So they would be moved away from wherever it was produced and, and then, of course, wherever it was consumed. Yeah. And the other thing is when Kevin and I were brewing beer back before all even we did those kind of things, um, I would keep the spent grain and make bread from it. So I wonder if you just, you, you'd never get those remains because, yeah. you know, so many well, states. Well, yeah, they are getting the grains of contrapata. They are, yeah. They're kind of speckled throughout. So the moye, I think, is very confusing. Um, at Cerro Baul, certainly we've mm -hmm. got, like, thousands, tens of thousands of moye seeds in pots. 
<laughs> that were for fermenting moye um, that have scorch marks on the bottom that are in situ brewery remains. Um, Cancho Pata, the ubiquity of, of moye is difficult. I think they have one context that has very high densities that suggests brewery. Um, the rest of it is just, it's common in the fire. And so it's the kind of plant that drops a lot of fruit and that just walking around, it sticks to your feet and animals track it. And so then how much is enough to say it's a brewery? I think finding the actual remains of the technology of the brewing, that the pots in the ground, like Katie Chu has that at San Jose de Moro and they had that at Cerro Baul. It may be that, you know, I mean, it's not gonna be something at every house. It's not gonna be something at every sort of neighborhood even potentially. Um, well, so we just may not find it, it. right? Know we don't. Need it every house zero. Right. So Concho Pata, that wasn't the case, but at Wari, it could be. Don't right. forget, it's not just moye; it's maize. Right, and that's that's and very true. You find sprouting. Yeah. They sprout the maize before they do it. So when you find burnt sprouted maize, that tends to be a signal for. Food. And it is true. It is true. So, um, you know, ethnographically, they, you know, I read that. Is I got really on this guinea pig kick because I had the guinea pig pellets and then the seeds. There's a higher density of moye in that fire as well, um, which it looks like ethnographically there's some record of people feeding moye beer guts to guinea pigs. Um, so I thought, started thinking about that. Um, that's possible. Um, I do think that that is very true that you know, they, they would be using that resource to feed these animals because there's, I mean, yeah. They're keeping, I'm sure they're keeping guinea pigs in their homes. We just haven't quite excavated the context yet. And maybe we even have, there's some like shoddy walls that don't finish, that could have been finished with like cane and wood, that could have been a cooey pen, um, that I hope we could figure that out. I think that they're raising guinea pigs in the house, and in that case, yeah, it's definitely true that if they were doing small scale, you know, corn beer or something, you give that stuff to the guinea pigs. Um, or take it to the corrals, wherever they may be when the yamas are near and feed it to them. Yeah. Or alpacas, actually, we have a, a higher, looks like they're engaged with alpacas more than yamas so far in the data. What does their dung look like? Can you identify plants with them? In yama dung, yeah, you can. Yeah. yeah. There's fairly small pellets still, though, for yama mm -hmm. compared to the size of the animal. Yeah. I think so. I, I have a question not about dung. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Kind of commoner, and then you got this, this complex. Yeah. Um, Do, does anybody know? Have they yeah, I think that, that talking about sort of classes in that way is, is maybe assuming a lot. Um, so, so, so yes, there, so there are more, so there are more, um, there are more rural sites uh, in Ayacucho uh, away from Wari that have that don't have this kind of architecture, that don't have the sort of patio with the gallery rooms, okay. that still are engaged with Wari material culture, that are still probably engaged with whatever power structure is at Wari. Um, okay, so but they live in sort of round houses, yeah. And, okay. and, and that's what you were looking for, yeah. maybe about this complex. Yeah, I think it was, it was maybe a little, yeah. It's still the yeah, center, right? Yeah, right, right, right. So that was that. that the, I'm not gonna find home. That's a word in like our NSF grant, you know, that that was what they were looking for. Yeah. Um, I didn't kind of expect that, but I think it's still worthwhile to look at the daily lives of potentially, you know, I don't know how, you know, urban rich or whatever, class. but yeah, a, an urban class or so, something along those lines. Um, well, and so Yeah. Have been forested or yeah. Too dry. Yeah. So I, I'm not. I, I have friends that work in the area, and I'm embarrassed that I don't know enough about what they do. But um, so, do they have like mechanisms, like markets or whatever, that could be bringing wood in, like the Maya? Have, where wood was one of their trade goods. Yeah. So I mean, is, is there a similar kind of? Yeah. There's there's definitely trade infrastructure. Yeah. Um, so would wood be one of those kind of goods? I th I think I think it's possible. I think people. There's not a lot of charcoal studies in the Andes, no, but people have found it's foreign. Do is do a taxa. You know, if you can identify it, yeah. it's just all local, then it's happening. Okay. 
yeah, harvesting locally, but yeah. you should be able to figure out if it's like from the eastern slope. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's a specific course. wood that's being traded in the land. So right. Like, like, like pine. Yeah. Pine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like you can do that. Yeah. That's a good question. That's a good question. I think what I read is prepared charcoal was one um, was one uh, mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess it depends because they use it in different contexts. You get it in ritual contexts. Yeah. You get it in you know burning contexts. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I have another um, question for you because I, I I never see you anymore. So. No. <laughs> I, I never see you but you know where he is. I do now. Yeah. Um. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a and lot more to. Yes, the although floor? the, the, yeah, so it's, I think, so, I think so. Yeah, the, the early one is, the late one is a little bit more confusing. Uh, that was inserted later. So a lot of the living remains on that surface is probably an earlier time period. And then somewhere in the 800s or 900s, somebody dug through a couple of floors and went all the way down and put those pots that have the Tiwanaku faces. Uh, deep down there in there. There are fragmented things that are sealed away, not the whole thing. Like uh, that bottle was a fragment. That bottle was yeah, a I don't think they've done enough work. I mean, so, so cons cons consider, yeah. consider our field season ended in August, and then like, uh, we barely had a lab going by the end of it, and so the ceramic analysis is very early. Oh, right. So people yeah. just grabbed what was cool and <laughs> took photos of it. So. <laughs> Yeah, I can't believe they actually found a golden idol. Um, but I, yeah, it does. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you have flatstone architecture, or you also have So for us, um, the architecture is in some places uh, plastered. Everything is is like feel. Yeah. 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 And so. Almost every wall is sort of fieldstone and, and like not super fancy masonry. Some of them are there, you know, the sort of lajas that are, you know, flat stones like that that are sort of in there, a little bit more care to sort of pick flat faces for everything. Um, but typically they're all plastered and like painted white in anywhere that we've found some plaster. Um, so that's that. In the ceremonial sectors, yeah, they've got they've got like. They've got the Tiwanaku style and the Inca style stuff yeah. where it's, you know, slabs of, yeah. yeah, with tight joints. And then they also have, you know, flat flagstone floors in places. Yeah. You just did wall trenches, but did you follow it down the bedrock and say if they were using the bedrock? A few walls have been brought down that far. Okay. So the, the wall trenching doesn't go that. We find the top and then. It's like it's pretend. Yeah. We had a team that was like always wall trenching and yeah. it was. <laughs> Impossible to keep up with that, basically. Um, yeah. We have the slope is um, it's a it's about ten percent probably yeah. or like fifteen. It's not not too bad, but it's a hill. Um, so yes, uh, there are, so there are thicker walls that we're sort of unpacking with what their place is within the neighborhood layout, um, that one of them was dug down to bedrock and is like in bedrock. It's this, it's this wide and it's very well built and it has a little canal sort of like cutting through the under of it. So. I think so. Yeah. Although we have a lot of blue and green precious yeah, stones. At least, at least down in the base of Sarabal, um, sodalite appears in the bedrock. So we would find powdered sodalite and it got flagged as, a, as some sort of possible ritual feature. Yeah. But what it yeah. could also have been was actually just a vein of sodalite in the bedrock that had been exposed through preparing for the wall foundation. You know, we had, in, in, I think in that sort of later pottery deposit cache thing, there was, spe she, the, the excavator that did that, Brittany Fullen, she went so 
painstakingly through it. It was because it, it was. I mean, it was deep. It was like just stuff, just crazy jungle fruits that I haven't identified. There's some weird stuff in there that they're depositing together, which would be really interesting. But there was also little bits of like green powder yeah. throughout it. It just pops out of the bedrock. Interesting. So that's what I noticed. Yeah. Anyway, It's like a caliche. It's it's uh, it's like a it's heavily lime based. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's I don't I don't know across the whole site. It's probably diverse because there's actually up the hill a ways you can. Oh okay okay. Um, oh okay. Gotcha. All right. Well, up up the hill I think it's possible that there is so light in the bedrock because there's it's called turquesa. Loma de Turquesa or something, it, and and so like you can just walk along the surface and you see glittering blue and green like in the soil. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we haven't done any work to sort of figure out the sourcing for all the different stone that was in there, but it's really remarkable because at Conchopata, I think it was like ninety-eight percent obsidian, and at this site it's like 50% obsidian and like chert and all these different and it's not just one kind of obsidian there's stuff with weird veins and <laughs> we got people we'll be breaking if, that down if that's the case that you have flint and obsidian and what looked like a piece of quartzite all right there then yeah that's not all local yeah i don't think so right yeah nico the obsidian um culture pot that's really close to that crappy source with the white speckles okay yeah Okay. So you look like you have a little obsidian. Yeah. Is it pretty black or do you have a little? Yeah, one that had orange streaks. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That like piece Yeah. Um, yeah. There's definitely. I would. I would think there's a diversity of sources. I. I. I just that wasn't my analysis. <laughs> but yeah, put your pockets right there. That's right. Like maybe why you have so much of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean that speaks of different. Yeah. That's. I mean that speaks a lot, right? Because I mean. If Wari had a lot of power over the folks at Conchapata, then they're either choosing to engage with foreign stuff, which I think makes sense for them, or you know, the Conchapata people are keeping the, that obsidian source to themselves for their sort of daily lives, and Wari's not well, coming over there for that. Too, yeah. Okay. Like okay. All right. Can I ask about the fat, the trenching, wall trenching, and wall digging that you just mentioned? Uh huh. So how does that work? Okay, so um, it, this is a, our, our PI, Bill Isbell. This is sort of his, his love. Yeah. Um, so what it is, is... This is a strategy to follow the walls. Yes. Yeah, so all it is is basically we had walls in the old 1990s ex excavations. They lined in a certain direction. We then put like a two by one unit where we, it looked like that wall should come out. We found the wall, and then it's just like surface, surface clearing to get the top of the wall. Okay, so it's just surface clearing. Yeah, except for when it went deep, and then like, I, th I this yeah, sometimes they the were. Wall went deep. Yeah. Okay. Some yeah sometimes the walls were you know twenty centimeters down. Sometimes they were over a meter, and people just and stopped. You need to dump both sides. Yeah. So yeah, my, about this much on both sides. Okay. Yeah. My, my question about that related to micromorph sampling. Oh, uh, okay. Because um, the place where a floor meets a wall is the best place to get evidence of what was going on on that floor. Right. Especially well, if there was any kind of coverings over the floor. The floors are lower than the wall trenches okay. go. So we're not, we're not damaging the floors. Because when you mentioned that, they, you were seeing if they went down to bedrock, I was like, oh, God. Don't tell me no, no, the one, yeah, the, the one that they did go down to bedrock, that was an excavation unit that was dug, you know, properly. <laughs> but yeah, the wall trenching has, has been, it's been a struggle. I mean, the idea is just we want to get through all that. But basically, there's all this, like, really, there's all this really, like, amazing artifacts that are sort of, like, at that level that there's, we have very little control of the space of where they come from. Well, that's the sacrifice for yeah. getting yeah, so basically I get, you know, half of our loci are those, and I sampled like 5% of them. No, no, um, the problem with, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting season. I had, yeah, I had a lot of, 
hats. Um, but yeah, he always says that the GPR is hard. Not only is it like, obviously we cleared a lot of it. Um, so at that point we could have done the GPR. But yeah, there's an idea that like there's so much sort of large rock along along the way, it would probably be too much noise. Well, you would, um, and you also, Yeah, right. Know how you would resolve okay. Maybe Fair enough. Yeah. Is there room for, room for GPR? Yeah, like if you had such a dense, dense architecture, would you get nice clear signals with GPR? Yeah, a bunch of layers will all fall off, like each will all fall off. But it's, it was a, it's sort of a uh, synchronic, like there isn't a lot of LMP or anything. No, yeah, I mean, our highest. Our radiocarbon dates that are the latest are like at, at latest like 990 and, yeah. and that was, I expected to be like almost modern. Mm -hmm. It was very shallow below the surface um, and it was just like there was a utilitarian pot busted and like some scattered ash and a little yeah. bit of charcoal and we dated that stuff figuring this is the top, what do we got? And it was like 990, it's so it was, it's yeah. It's like one of the few places that would be yeah. yeah, yeah. nobody touched Wari, except for whatever was going on in the 14th century. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you might find Barpa walls that come online. That could yeah, be yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I wonder, I mean, one of the sort of implications of this is that, you know, from what I've looked at with our sort of, our preliminary inventory ceramic forms, in terms of what styles are present, I, I at least have a sense of presence, absence of styles. The, the lower levels uh, of all of these, all the trash in there and like on the surface, et cetera, are almost all Warpa. Like there's, there's not a lot of Chalky Pampa. And if it is Chalky Pampa, it's not the red, it's the very early Chalky Pampa pottery. So the Wari Wari pottery is not what the people that built Wari used. <laughs> the like ultra limited distribution stuff that seems to be like Wari. Potentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, thank you. <laughs>